How does that look and sound? Can you hear anything? Alright, I'm going to try going to YouTube, so it may get a little choppy for a second. And I'm going to see if I can watch the, not the stream, but the chat. Okay. How is that? Much better than last week. Okay, good. Yeah, I had to install an antenna, but <laughs> it should be better. Give me one second. So we got three people. I'll give it a few more minutes. Not very long, though. Okay, so, hi, I'm David Ishi. Um, I'm a biohacker, work with Josiah. The, um, the class today, if you'll look on the thing, is uh, week three, so this is PCR and gel electrophoresis. Um, today we're gonna be sort of preparing for actually running PCR, and so that's gonna be uh, something that you will try to do this week. Um, you should have in your supplies uh, some plasmid and some primers, uh, and we're going to try to amplify uh, a section of that. So uh, just as a brief recap, um, since we covered sort of the, the inner workings of PCR last week, uh, just to sort of go over uh, what we're going to be doing in general terms, we're going to be using a thermocycler, uh, which is this machine that um, uh, fluctuates the temperature on a program for specific times. That uh, will help us to control the activity of uh, enzymes in a controlled reaction. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using this, right, which is TAC polymerase. Uh, it's an enzyme that extends DNA that's single-stranded across a template. So a long piece of single-stranded DNA with a short piece of DNA bound to it will make double-stranded DNA. And then the polymerase will bind and extend that along the template. And as it does it, it will make, we use the complementary base pair sequence. So if there's an A, it'll place a T. If there's a C, it'll place a G and so on. And eventually it'll make a duplicate of uh, the complementary strand. 
then we'll heat it up, separate those two strands, add another primer to each one, extend those, and then we'll have two copies. Then we'll use heat to separate those into four single-stranded, add more primers, extend those, I have four double-stranded copies. Use heat to separate those, now we have eight, and so on and so on, so you do enough steps, and you end up with billions of strands of double-stranded DNA of a particular segment that you're trying to make copies. Now, the primers for this just look like this, okay, so they're just clear liquid, because they're a, a very small quantity of DNA molecules suspended in water. And you'll have two of them, a forward primer and a reverse primer. And you'll have template DNA, or you may have to produce template DNA. But the template is, in this case, a GFP plasmid. So it's a plasmid uh, that makes a protein called uh, green fluorescent protein. Um, we're going to copy a segment by binding our primers, using our polymerase, and it's going to be in sequence. So the first thing I want to go over is uh, when you're some things you look out for, some things that you need to be aware of in general when you're making these. Now you're going to be using water as one of your reagents, but you're not going to use tap water because the enzyme is very uh, particular to uh, metals and uh, different minerals have a different interactions. So depending on your tap water, which can vary from time to time, place to place, you can end up with some very different results. So if your tap water has, for example, a little bit of magnesium in it, it can change the activity of the enzyme and completely screw up your PCR. So for PCR, uh, you can use distilled water, um, but sometimes it does give issues. Um, if you're just talking about like distilled water from a grocery store in a, in a jug. Um, but the really good stuff is gonna be like reagent grade water. Mine's still partially frozen. Um, and so they make water that has uh, uh, it's, it's made for this kind of work, so it's molecular biology grade water. And it's important because it also has a few other things that are done to it in the processing. One of the things that's done uh, is they remove other enzymes, because you can't necessarily guarantee that your water is free of enzymes. Um, and they can get there because there can be living organisms in your water. Even though your water is supposed to be clean, who knows. Um, and you can have problems, occasionally, with uh, enzymes like DNases that will digest your DNA that you put in as your template, uh, especially the short little primers. It doesn't take much to digest them into nothing. Um, and that can throw off your PCR reaction, uh, which, of course, isn't what you want. So these have been treated, this, this kind of water has been treated to remove DNAs, DNases, enzymes that digest DNA, and RNases, uh, and things like that that might throw off other kinds of PCR, like if you're doing reverse transcription PCR. Um, so, uh, you can get sort of the good water, and it's a little expensive, but it's not terrible. Um, but I do recommend it, and there are different polymerases. Uh, in this case, we're using uh, TAC, uh, which is the most common polymerase that there really is. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of the first one and the cheapest one, and it's uh, from the bacteria Thermus aquaticus, which is a uh, bacteria originally derived from Yellowstone. And they are, um, uh, they live in hot springs. So they have a, a polymerase, a DNA polymerase, that's thermally stable because they live in a hot environment so they can handle the heat of a PCR reaction without breaking down. Uh, but there are also other ones that have um, extra activity. So there are other ones that will do error correction and all kinds of other stuff that allow them to um, uh, make fewer errors. TAC will make more errors, but if you're doing a relatively short piece or you're doing something that's not absolutely critical, um, like for example, if you're gonna do something that you're gonna transform a thousand of into bacteria, um, if some of them are mistaken and some of them are okay, eh. uh, and there are ways to control the error rate in other ways, but we don't need to get into that. So uh, for now we're gonna use TAC because it's, it's super cheap and easy. Um, let's see, and let me look right here, alright, now in the lesson plan, in the reading material, they're using a 2x tech master mix, um, in mine, I actually have a 5x, so that's something that you need to pay attention to, is whether or not you have 2x mix or 5x mix, because that'll change your uh, ratios, 
So minus 5x, and 5x means that it's five times more concentrated than it ends up needing to be. So by the end of it, I need to dilute this five times. Uh, if you have 2x tag master mix, you need to dilute it two times, which makes it pretty easy. That just means half of your reaction is going to be your master mix. And the master mix contains not just the polymerase, but also uh, ATP because it's an enzyme doing work, so it needs an energy source, so it's going to be using ATP as its energy source. It also contains the free nucleotides, the A, T, C, and G that get assembled into DNA. It is in here, and so you, you'll need that, obviously. And then it also contains uh, all the salts and uh, minerals and things that it needs uh, for the enzyme to do its job. So this is like that's why they call it a master mix, because it's got everything. So you don't have to worry about custom mixing it. Um, let's see. So uh, if yours is a 2x, which is what the lessons plan has, uh, then you're going to do half of it. So if we're going to do a 50 microliter reaction, then you're going to use 25 microliters of 2x. In my case, I won't. The um, uh, template, uh, it can vary depending on the concentration of template but generally you can put just a microliter if you have like a mini prep and you're using that you can put a microliter um, there's variation significant variation in the amount of template DNA uh, that still works in PCR so you can use from extremely small amounts theoretically like one molecule should work but up to a hundred nanograms which is an insane number of molecules so if you're looking at um, something like plasmid, you've got a lot of flexibility there, so usually you just put one microliter. Uh, if you've got, um, if you're having weird problems, you can look at adjusting the template concentration, but for the most part, um, kind of more is better, uh, but there's probably a limit to that, and it also depends on what your downstream application is. So if, for example, you're going to be transforming this, if you use a lot of template, uh, and you don't have a purification step in between PCR and whatever you're doing next, you might have a lot of background. So you might end up with a lot of your template DNA if you use a lot of it in the first step, transforming into your bacteria at the last step. And if you have that, then you'll have a lot more hassle um, downstream trying to sort out which colonies are which than you would uh, just diluting this a bit, right? So. Uh, your primers. Now they may come pre-mixed uh, together and they may be separate. Now you can get, if you uh, purchase primers for a PCR reaction that you design, uh, you're, they're going to arrive lyophilized. So they're going arri to arrive basically freeze-dried freeze -dried in a tube. And what you're going to do is you're going to take those and you're going to dilute them. So when you're diluting primers, um, your, there are some standard ways to do that, um, which I guess really is outside the scope here. Um, and we're going to um, go forward, I guess. So let's see. The primers that you have, uh, if they're premixed, if they're premixed, the um, the primers will be. Um, if it says use one microliter, then just use two of the premixed. If they're separate, then use one of each. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to follow your uh, protocol here, so you can just sort of do what I do here, simplify it, even though it'll kind of be goofed up for mine. Uh, let's see. So for your water, uh, this is going to be a 50 microliter reaction. And that 50 microliter reaction is going to go in a pretty small tube. So, looking at your um, looking at your reaction, uh, looking or looking at your thermocycler, you'll have different size tubes, but most of them are going to have a really small tube, about like this. So, when you're setting up your reaction, if you have these tiny little tubes, then first thing you want to do is label it. So, label it. PCR. You can label it whatever it is, but it's a good habit to be in labeling all your stuff. And then we're going to start building the reaction. 
Now, generally, you want to add the, uh, the tack or the polymerase last. So usually I add the water first. Um, let's see. So 23 microliters of distilled water. So you can take your pipette. Make sure I can see me. OK, so you can take your pipette. You're going to set it to 23. It's that easy. So 23. And now make sure that this is the right pipette. If you have a bigger pipette, don't use the big one. Uh, so these will use the small, like 20 microliter uh, tips. And so you're going to start with your water. Now, if you're making 50 mil or 50 microliter reactions, you know it's fairly easy to see the big stuff. Okay, and make sure you completely clear the tip, and you should be able to see your water in there. Then discard that tip. It's important that you discard your tip between steps because the last thing you want to do is contaminate your polymerase or your ultra clean water with PCR primers or something like that, right? So we can get a brand new tip, and we're going to add template DNA. So for this, we're going to use uh, one microliter of the uh, GFP primer mix. Uh, so it looks like y'alls are pre-mixed. So setting that to one. And mine aren't pre-mixed, we're going to pretend they are. Okay, now this is a very, very small quantity of liquid here, right? So hard to see, should not take up a lot of space in your pipette tip. And when you go, go all the way into the liquid and just be kind of gentle with it. If you don't know how to pipette, uh, just make sure, especially when you're doing uh, one microliter, uh, because it's such a small qu quantity, the difference between sort of the correct position and too far is very, very small. So it's, it's really only going about that far. So you'll feel it, but just make sure you don't go all the way down and you'll suck up way more. Okay, so that's if you have a primer mix with both primers in one, you've used one microliter, now we're going to use one microliter of template. So again, one microliter, and again you can see it's a very, very small quantity, very small. And you want to be able to put it down in the liquid. And, ugh, I'm doing such a bad job trying to do it for the camera. So, there it goes. Now we're going to add our uh, polymerase. So, in this case, we're doing um, 25 microliters because it's a 2x. And that'll be basically as big as the... Um, uh, as the previous step, so it'll be a pretty good bit. Mix that in, and now you'll see a little bit of uh, difference in these two, so kind of pipette up and down a few times, and that way you can sort of mix everything together. Because if you don't, you'll get um, uh, you'll get it kind of settling on the bottom because it's it's actually a little bit heavier. Um, if you get a little air bubble, like I just did, you'll kind of make foam, try not to do that. Now, uh, one thing that you want to pay attention to, or be mindful of, is uh, different thermocyclers are set up differently. So, if you have a heated lid, then this is pretty much the end of it, you're ready to go. And heated lids are used to prevent evaporation, because remember we're going up to 98C, so we're going near boiling, uh, and this is a really tiny volume of water. So you'll boil it off over the course of it and it'll screw up your reaction. Uh, even though it can't really leave, it'll just all be condensed at the top. So uh, what you can do, if you have a heated lid, then select use heated lid uh, as you start your reaction. If you don't have a heated lid, then you're going to need to add mineral oil. So, here's my mineral oil. Now I haven't had to do this in quite a while. 
I forget how much I normally add. Let's see. Let's do five. Now, mineral oil is thick, so uh, when you pull back with your pipette, just leave it in there for a second because it's going to need a second to move through that tiny tip, right? Um, if you just suck back and pull it out, then you might actually end up sucking up a good bit of air, more air than you think. So, from here, uh, you're going to add it, but it's important that you add it just to the top. So don't try to stick it below the liquid level because the idea is that the mineral oil is going to float on top of your PCR reaction and make a, a sort of evaporation resistant barrier, right? It'll just be a layer of oil on top and then your liquids can change temperatures below and it won't be free to evaporate. So you don't want to really mix this. You want to just put it on top and let it sort of make a layer. So it's important that you don't stick this below it. I'm trying to not cover the mic. All right. And then let's go a little more. That is not enough. I'm going to add 10 more, so let's make it 15 total. See, I'm spoiled with the heated lid. Alright. Let's go a little more. So that's going to be 25 total. I used to do this for all of them. Okay. So, and one thing to watch for that can be kind of screwy is your layer can be kind of um, uneven, so it'll be kind of on a slant, and then you'll end up with sort of evaporation off the side. So just make sure that the layer is nice and even. You'll be able to see that. And so you can see, so my camera will focus, you got two layers. And those two layers uh, give you uh, your nice barrier against evaporation. And again, you don't need to worry about that if you have a heated lid. If you don't have a heated lid, uh, then um, you'll need to use mineral oil. Otherwise, your PCR is going to get all screwed up. So, um, okay. Or you can read the thing. It says 50 microliters of mineral oil. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, so the protocol that they want to run is, or that you'd want to run, is uh, 95C for five minutes. And so remember the steps involved in uh, running a PCR reaction are, let me drag this over here, okay. So uh, you have your initial denaturing step, and its function is to just loosen everything up and get all your template uh, and primers free of any binding that they may have. It's a nice long step at a high temperature, so 95 degrees Celsius for 5 minutes. The second step, 95 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds. That's step 2. And really nothing changes, it just changes the step because we're going to need it in the loop. Then you drop down to 55C for 1 minute. And remember, 55C can vary a little bit depending on the primers that you're using. But for this reaction, you're going to use 55C because it's already been tested and it works like this. Um, then that's step three. Step four, you go down to 68 degrees Celsius for one minute because TAC polymerase extends best at 68 C. So that's sort of its optimal temperature. So it comes up to that temperature and you extend for one minute. It has a speed of about 1,000 bases per minute. So it's going to extend for about 1,000 bases. And then you go to step five, and that's to loop. So when you're programming that in your PCR machine, there will be some step like go to. Uh, so you'll say step five, go to, and then you'll uh, say go to step two, and then go to step two 30 times. So now, when it hits step five, it'll loop back to step two and do 95C for 15 seconds, 55C for a minute, 68C for a minute, go to step five, loop back 29 more times and it'll go through that. Each step, it's doubling the amount of DNA. Each step, you're, you've got this nice exponential increase in the amount of DNA. After it does that 30 times, it'll go down to a final extension step. Because PCR is not perfect, it will extend uh, a certain amount, and then it will um, um, sometimes just not get there, right? And so to make sure that they're all completely extended, 
uh, you have this nice long extension step, 65C, for five minutes. And that'll make sure that everything's pretty much even and fully extended. And that's your PCR reaction. You hit start, you let it run. Uh, by the end of it, it won't look any different uh, when you get it out of the thermocycler. Uh, but what you're going to do is you're going to start, or you're going to check that you have DNA by running it on an agarose gel. So uh, to make an agarose gel, you're going to mix TAE, all right, which should come like this basically, It'd be like a powder. Um, and you're going to take it and you're going to mix it with water, um, use distilled water. Um, you can take the um, uh, and the recipes over here. So it can be five grams of TAE to one liter of water. Um, the, the key thing here is uh, you're going to be making a good bit of buffer. So if you, if you uh, I usually make smaller quantities, but you can make a large quantity and you can store it and use it for later. Uh, but uh, if you have a more precise scale, you can, you can go to smaller quantities per run. Uh, but you're going to take some of that buffer, and this is important, don't use water. I've actually seen people who went to school for this make this mistake. Um, you're going to make a gel, and you're going to do that by adding agarose, right? So this is agarose, right? And so it is a, uh, it's a sugar. And uh, it's a special sugar because it ends up making a gel kind of like gelatin. And so that gel is uh, the matrix through which you're going to pull your DNA when you're doing electrophoresis. And you're going to make, make that gel by mixing the buffer, the TAE buffer that you just made, with uh, agarose. And the recipe's on here, so you can use 0.5 grams of agarose. Uh, and you're going to use 50 milliliters of TAE buffer, right? So you're going to mix your buffer with your agarose, and you're going to microwave it. So it uh, depends on the temperature of your microwave. Just nuke it for a minute. If you're doing it in a bottle-shaped thing, I usually do mine in this bottle. Uh, and you can see this is my gel from yesterday. I just slice it up and store it and reuse it. Um, you can only get so many reuses out of it, though. Make sure that you open the cap. Uh, you don't want the cap all the way open because uh, it'll kind of boil and then just fly out the top and just be a goop in your microwave. Um, but you also don't want the cap screwed down tight or it may explode. So uh, you want it sort of loose, just barely on there. Uh, that way steam can come out, but it doesn't do it. Or the way I do it is I use painter's tape. So what I do is I just tape the lid down uh, and that prevents it from boiling over so much, um, but I don't have to worry about it blowing up because the tape will come off. Uh, but it usually takes about 60 seconds. Um, just check it, kind of swirl it around, make sure there's no solids, especially if you have a weaker microwave. Um, if it is, just give it a little more time. It'll be clear, clear. Um, then you're going to be adding your stain, right? So the stain is, is going to be gel green, right? Oh, there's the camera. Or gel stain, gel safe. So this is 10,000 X, right? So it's 10,000 times more concentrated than your uh, final product, right? So if you're doing uh, five, or excuse me, if you're doing 50 milliliters of gel, then you're gonna be adding five microliters of stain. So again, you're gonna be using your pipette. You're gonna get a new tip. You're gonna set it to five pull up five microliters of your stain, and you're gonna add that to your gel when it's warm, but not boiling hot. Uh, and that's important because the, uh, the stain is actually a little temperature sensitive and it will break down. So you take your uh, sort of molten uh, gel out of the microwave, and you um, just give it a second at room temperature to cool down. Uh, I don't recommend sticking it under water unless you have uh, borosilicate glass, because uh, it will break but uh, just let it cool, add the five microliters of stain, swirl it around, make sure it mixes up good, and then you're gonna pour it in your uh, casting tray. And so your casting tray will be part of your gel electrophoresis kit. It'll be a small sort of U-shaped tray, um, and you will uh, add your combs. The combs will um, uh, sit down in the tray, and they'll sit down with the, um, sort of so that the teeth sink down into the gel. You'll pour the stained 
agar, or the stained agarose gel in there, and you'll let it fill up to the point that it's, it's um, sort of got the teeth stuck down in it. When that happens, uh, you're just going to let it sit. It'll take 30 minutes, hour, let it cool off, and really let the gel set up. Uh, from there, you're going to remove the, the comb, and you'll end up with all these little holes. All those little holes are your um, are your wells, and so each well is a place you can load DNA into. So when you're loading DNA into a well, um, the issue is that your DNA, in this case, is in uh, basically water, and so it will just diffuse into what's also basically salt water, and it won't fall down into the well. So there's another thing that you'll be using, uh, which is this stuff and that is uh, loading die. The loading die uh, is, depends on the loading die, different loading dies have different sort of uh, mixes. Uh, looks like you have 6x loading buffer, uh, so you're going to use 9 microliters of your loading buffer, and there's different ways you can mix it. You can just dump that loading buffer into your PCR reaction, squirt it straight in there and then mix it up. It's heavier than water because it's usually got either sugars or uh, something like glycerol. And then you can take that and uh, it will make the whole mix heavier so that when you pick it up with your pipette uh, and you load it into the gel, and you have to really work on your hand skills here because when you have the gel, you're gonna put the gel in your, cap, in your uh, overall electrophoresis rig. Uh, you'll have your electrodes hooked up and your power supply. You're going to pour uh, more of your um, uh, TAE buffer on top of that gel. So before you add the DNA, you're going to add buffer on top of the gel. And what that's going to give you is um, just a layer of liquid all the way across because the electrodes need to be submerged in the buffer so that when you turn it on, the, the flow of current going through the gel goes through the buffer. And so that's your, that's your uh, sort of conductive material. And as it flows, it will uh, move through. And so you have this, this uh, flow of current that will draw the DNA. And the DNA is negatively charged. It'll move towards the positive electrode. So make sure the positive electrode is facing the bottom of the gel. So if you're looking at your gel, the comb is at the top and everything gets pulled to the bottom. Now, you don't turn the power supply on yet add your buffer, your gel's in place, the buffer's completely submerged, or the, the gel's completely submerged, and you're going to add your uh, loading die. You can either add it directly here, or if you have something like parafilm, you can put a little dot on the parafilm, and then you can pick up some of this and mix it on the parafilm, and then put it in the gel, but however you want to do it. Take that, pick it up, and then uh, you're going to put it inside one of the wells in the gel. And you have to be careful not to tear them, because they're they're like jello, they're pretty fragile. Uh, and so don't just stab it in there. Be very real careful and look real closely, make sure it's well lit, and just easily put it down in there. And you want to just ease it in real slow, don't squirt aggressively or it'll just spray out. And just let it displace the water and it'll be a tiny little um, cup of gel filled with your uh, blue or purple liquid. And that tells you that your DNA is sitting in the well. Now, you're also going to add a DNA ladder. And the ladder is important because running the gel will help you to see DNA, but it won't help you to measure it. So the DNA ladder is going to be another tube, and it will have, um, it'll have uh, chopped up pieces of DNA that are all of specific sizes. And so it'll look like a ruler once it's run. And that ruler will have uh, a low, as DNA moves through the gel, smaller, shorter pieces move through more quickly. Imagine uh, trying to move pieces of chain through uh, sort of an obstacle course. The longer they are, the more caught up on things they get. So as you pull it through, uh, the shorter pieces will move more quickly and the longer pieces will move more slowly and over time, even though they were loaded together, they'll all separate out into a bunch of bands. And so the smallest bands will be on the bottom and because the ladder is a sort of predefined thing, you know what the uh, size of each band is. So once you can see them, then you say, all right, this band is 
a thousand base pairs and this band is five thousand and this band is so on or if you have a smaller one this is a hundred whatever it is so you have to look at your particular ladder to know what each band is and then you say okay uh, I'm gonna run my ladder right here and I'm gonna run my sample right here and you run them in wells next to each other so once they're both loaded and you're gonna take your um, gel or your your ladder uh, let's see and you're gonna add uh, you're going to add it right next to it. Uh, look at your ladder or look at the protocol that should tell you exactly how much, like five microliters of 100 base pair ladder. And you'll add them, you'll add that in the well next to your sample, your PCR generated DNA, and you'll run them next to each other. And the ladder should spread out, but the other one should stay a single band, hopefully. Uh, and when it does, you'll be able to measure it by saying, okay, this is right next to this one, and this band is so many base pairs. So if it's a thousand base pairs and your band's right next to it, then you know it's bigger than the 200 base pair, it's bigger than the 300, it's right across from the thousand, but it's smaller than the 1500. So you know that your ladder, your sample is a thousand base pairs. If it's running somewhere else, uh, with PCR-generated DNA, it shouldn't do that. Maybe something went weird. Uh, if you see multiple bands, maybe something went weird. Um, it's a little bit different if you're running plasmid. Now, plasmid DNA is, um, uh, it, because it's circular, it can have sort of different um, secondary structures and can run funky. But we're not running uh, plasmid today. Though, if you use a lot of template DNA, you might actually see some plasmid uh, also running. So if you look, if you see a strange, thin, ghostly band somewhere above your PCR product, uh, check your plasmid template size and see if it's the same size because you may just be seeing a little bit of your template DNA uh, sort of showing up in your, in your reaction. So uh, once you do that, uh, you're, you're gonna run your, uh, once you have everything loaded, you're going to run it. You're actually going to turn on the power supply. And you're going to run it for, um, depends on the size of the gel, 1,000 bases, probably 20 minutes. Um, but keep an eye on it. Uh, if you see, there will be a, a, a die in both the DNA ladder and also in the loading buffer. right? And so those two dies will be visible even without the blue light. And so you'll just be able to look at it with your normal eyeballs and see it. Uh, if you uh, see that ladder getting really low, or that uh, um, blue dye getting really low, it's time to, to shut off the power supply and check it. If it's, um, uh, because that's just supposed to be there as an indicator, it really doesn't do anything at all other than tell you that things are moving into the, into the gel and getting pretty far along. But that blue dot won't run with your DNA. Your DNA will run separately from it. It's also going through the process of electrophoresis, and it'll separate based on how it moves through the gel. The um, uh, the thing that you're going to look for is once you get it comfortably out of the wells, but you know, say uh, a quarter of the way down, it's time to give it a little check. Take your blue light, and you're going to put on your uh, sort of orange glasses, and the idea there is the dye, the stain that you added, this 10,000x stain reacts with DNA and binds to it. When it does, it becomes fluorescent. And so if you add a blue light, a blue light or a UV light, uh, which blue light's much safer both for your DNA sample and you, uh, the blue light uh, will, it's, it's the, um, it'll absorb that light and fluoresce a slightly different color. So that means you have blue light and you flood the area with blue light, the DNA in that, with the stain stuck to it, will um, uh, will react and fluoresce. And so anywhere where there's DNA in that gel, it'll fluoresce. And then the uh, fluorescent signal will be green light instead of blue light. So then you need a filter because there's all this blue light, it's hard to see. So you put on the glasses and you filter out most of the blue light. The green light still gets through. So you flood it with blue light, filter out the blue, and all you're left with is the green. So now you can see your individual bands somewhere in the gel. Then you can read the gel to tell you both how much, um, what size the DNA is, but also it tells you things like uh, the intensity. So if you've got a good light source, you can look at it and you can kind of compare 
the brightness of the DNA that you made to the DNA in the ladder. The DNA in the ladder will have a known uh, concentration. And so the more DNA in a spot, the, um, uh, the brighter the glow will be, up to a point. Uh, it gets to a point where it's so saturated that you can't really see past that. So, but if you're in the like 100 nanogram range, then you'll be able to see uh, pretty clearly. So the latter will usually have something like 50 nanogram bands and then a, a bright one and maybe a bright one up here. Uh, and those will be 100 nanograms. So uh, if your band looks just like, just as bright as the 100 nanogram band, then you can guess that the, say you loaded five uh, into your um, well, then you can just take that 100 and divide by 5, and that tells you the concentration. If you loaded 10, then you just divide by 10, it tells you the concentration. If it looks more like the 50, you can do that. And if you're really curious and you want to be accurate with it, you can actually do a, a set of dilutions, where you can take your DNA sample and dilute it a couple of times, and then do the math and figure out pretty accurately uh, what the concentration of the DNA in your sample is. Um, and that gives you a lot of useful information. To know both the concentration and the size tells you things like, uh, basically you can estimate how many DNA molecules you have, which you may need if you're doing things like subcloning and ligation. Um, let's see, we went through most of it. The GFP PCR product should be out 720 base pairs. So when you're looking at it, you should be able to see about 700 bases. Um, let's see, yep, looks like Josiah has posted Video demonstrates running the gel, and let's see. <laughs> All right, and no, you don't have to purify the PCR product. Uh, if you're doing some things, maybe it works better if you do. Um, let's see, are there any other questions? Because I think I've covered all the material. See if I can think of anything else that might need to be covered. Uh, and if you have any questions about programming your thermocycler or anything like that, just post it uh, on the Google Classroom thing, uh, and I'll try to answer that as well. And oh, one more thing. Do I can see it? So when you're picking up your sample, it's one important thing that I failed to mention is don't pick up your. Um, don't pick up your mineral oil. So when you're doing it, you're going to reach all the way through the mineral oil layer, and then you're going to pick up um, the water. Now, one thing that I've noticed is if you uh, just stab it barely through, and then you start picking up a relatively large quantity, like let's say uh, nine microliters, then if you do it really quickly, you can actually slurp up a little mineral oil as well. So go pretty close all the way to the bottom. I usually just touch mine to the bottom for a second. Uh, and then just release the pipette uh, fairly gently. So, you do this. You've got your mineral oil layer. Go ahead and depress the pipette. Reach all the way through to the bottom. Pick it up and leave the mineral oil layer. And I always like to kind of wipe it off a little bit because there'll be a good bit of mineral oil stuck to it. Uh, and then when you load that into your um, into your well, you'll end up with uh, sort of mineral oil floating around. But uh, the only thing, only other thing is I recommend is as you're going through there, just go ahead and touch the very bottom of the tube. Uh, it, it, sometimes you can get sort of a film around the base of it and it makes it slurp up just a little bit. Uh, not that it really affects anything. Um, Let's see, any other questions? I suppose you can save PCR product for downstream applications. Yes, so uh, if, you, if you need to purify the product, how is that done? So if you're gonna purify your PCR product, like say you're gonna use it for uh, some tricky subcloning, or you're gonna maybe transform with it, or you're gonna use it for something important and you need to separate maybe um, uh, the enzymes from it, they actually make kits. Uh, the kits are pretty easy. It's very similar to a mini prep, 
except uh, it's got fewer buffers really and so you just sort of run it on a column wash it and then run it out pretty straightforward um, and those kits I don't know if the Odin sells those but you can get them the uh, I suppose I can save part of the PCR product for downstream applications you definitely can uh, the gel electrophoresis is used for a few things uh, it can actually be used for purification um, there is a method where you can actually run uh, run your DNA through a gel physically cut the gel out with a razor blade grab the little gel slice uh, and then there's an, you can use another kit to sort of melt the gel and extract and purify the DNA out of it um, and that can be useful if you've got like multiple bands of DNA that need to be separated you can separate them from each other on the gel and then just cut out this one and use it um, and it can also be useful if you're doing things uh, where you have to separate an enzyme from DNA but that's a little harder than need be and a lot of times especially if you have PCR downstream of gel purification uh, the agarose can screw up your PCR so um, uh, but yeah, so the main thing that you're going to be using gel electrophoresis for uh, to start with is to make sure that your PCR worked. So yes, quality control. Uh, if your PCR doesn't work, then you'll see your ladder and you'll see no band. If you see no ladder and no band, then you screwed up gel electrophoresis. So um, check simple things like you mix your buffers correctly. Um, make sure that you uh, added your stain at a nice low temperature and the correct amounts. Uh, make sure that you um, um, make sure that you have your electrodes right. I don't know if your electrodes are reversible, uh, but make sure you didn't run your product up out of the gel, and make sure you didn't run it for too long. If you run it for a super long amount of time, it'll run all the way off the bottom of the gel and out into the buffer. Uh, eventually, make its way to the electrode. But if you don't, um, if you don't see anything, the other thing that may happen is that if you're uh, gel starts to get really hot. Uh, running TAE buffer, it can get hot after a long run, so if you run it for like an hour and a half or something, it's going to be really hot. And when, when your gel gets really hot, it sort of gets loose and uh, everything starts to kind of diffuse in it, and your DNA, instead of a nice sharp little band, will be just sort of a bleh, and then eventually you won't see anything at all. So don't overrun your gel, make sure you mixed everything right, make sure that you used the right quantities of everything on every step really check yourself and make sure that you weigh everything correctly um, and if you see nothing at all uh, run through those things if you see your ladder then you did gel electrophoresis correctly uh, but if you see no band but you do see a ladder then um, PCR didn't work uh, and sometimes PCR just gets screwy but the number one thing that causes PCR to fail is you used you, uh, you used the wrong amount of reagents or you mixed up tubes or something simple like that. So uh, just start again. Be really careful uh, with your tube labeling and uh, kind of have a system in your mind about how you're going to proceed through the tubes. Um, the, uh, uh, make, what I like to do is once I load something, like I put my uh, template in there, then I move the tube from the template farther away from me and then I do my primer I move the tube from my primer farther away from me I add my water and so on that way as I work through things they back up and I don't end up adding twice as much uh, template and no primer in which case you won't get anything um, and so you have uh, just basic quality control make sure you follow the steps very carefully and do it right and it should work uh, if it doesn't, sometimes it just doesn't, and just run it again and, and see if you get better luck. If um, And you'll know that you have it for that. If you're, um, and like Josiah is saying here, if you have uh, good quality uh, DNA and you have a nice bright band and it's the right size and everything looks great, uh, then you can sequence it or you can use it for all kinds of downstream applications. You can subclone and make new plasmids and use it as a CRISPR template and do all kinds of crazy things. Uh, but the first thing you may want to do is check that your PCR product uh, has the right sequence. You didn't get any weird mutations or anything. So you can send that off for Sanger sequencing, and they'll actually read the DNA for you and send you the sequence back uh, like on, over the Internet, and you'll be able to read it and compare it to what it's supposed to be and know that your DNA is right. And you can use that for a lot of other things too, like when you are... Um, uh, when you're doing things like subcloning, you can use PCR for quality control of your other reactions. 
So if you just made your own plasmid and you custom crafted a plasmid from, from piecing things together, then you can PCR across the change that you made, send that off and sequence it, and you'll be able to see in the sequence, oh, here's the, the piece of the original one, and here's the new thing I added, and here's the other piece of the original one, and you'll be able to see very clearly that your uh, modifications worked and that you made a sort of custom piece of DNA. Let's see, are there any other questions? Let's see. Got All right, is there anything else y'all would like before we call it? Sure didn't miss anything? So just to reiterate one thing, if you have a heated lid, just make sure that you actually turn the heated lid on, um, and otherwise you'll find the program in the thing, uh, in the uh, classroom materials. And uh, so your goal for this week is going to be to actually do this, actually uh, mix your reagents, make a gel, uh, run your gel. Uh, there's instructional videos that you can watch on how to both make the gel and run gel electrophoresis. And then the, um, uh, do the primers we have, we gotta have flanks so we could do a digest and have clonable parts. I don't know, I have to look at the primer sequence. Uh, Josiah can probably answer that one for you. Um, that may be in the plan. The, um, but as far as, uh, that's a thing that you can do, is you can, you can add five prime modifications to your primers so that you can uh, copy something and then use that to make it easier to, to subclone it and so on. But your goal for right now is just uh, get all your reagents ready, program your thermocycler, mix everything up, run your PCR. While your PCR is running, go ahead and make your gel. Once your gel is ready, um, go ahead and load it and run your gel out uh, and then take pictures um, always take pictures of your gels and just the easiest way is just put your glasses on your phone camera and put the light under it and take a picture it's kind of funny but you get used to it um, and then you'll be able to see here's my DNA here's that and then if you have any questions or whatever we can go over that if you have any weird effects if it doesn't work try again uh, try to get it to work before next week uh, that way you're not trying to play catch up. Uh, and if you have any questions or weird problems, you know, just ask on the thing. The, um, uh, so ideally, by next week, we'll have, so everybody, will, everybody will have successfully made their uh, PCR product and we'll go on to the next thing. Uh, let's see, next week is genotyping. So that's where we're going to actually do uh, some sequencing stuff. and. Uh, we'll have that, but for right now, let's try to get past this part so we can move on to that part. Um, any other questions? Looks like probably no. go ahead and call it if nobody has any questions um, that's everything uh, like I said ask if you have any trouble Let's see I don't know I have to get anything else.
Okay, so it'll automatically stop in uh, a few minutes. So I guess I'll hang out here. Let's see, I can try to answer your... So, I guess I will stop streaming. It may just go blank, or it may stop. I'm not sure. Oh wait, the primer using the primer blast on NCBI. Do you order primers exactly as they are regenerated by the blast? Uh, often you do. Um, if you are using blast, um, like the primer selector thing, um, that can work just fine. Or you can pick other primer combinations, or you can order all of them, and and see that we'll have something to work with. Um, but you may, depending on the project you're doing, have to have uh, modifications you need to make. Like you may be trying to subclone the gene that you are uh, that you blasted, and it just copies. So you add, uh, say, restriction sites to the five prime end of your primers so that you can use those cut sites to clone it into your vector of interest, right? Um, but uh, in this case, I don't know if they have those modifications or not. But okay, all right. Uh, I will see everybody next week, and we will be doing genotyping humans. So that'll be interesting.